Hundreds of miles of parkways and expressways and dozens of bridges and tunnels now connected the city to the suburban reaches of Long Island and beyond. Hundreds more had been driven through the outer boroughs themselves, weaving together, as Moses himself declared, the loose strands and frayed edges of the metropolitan arterial tapestry. But in all the frenzy of construction, the master builder had never been able to penetrate the heart of Manhattan itself with a superhighway. And in 1961, he resolved to do something about it, fixing in his sights a low-lying area of lower Manhattan, stretching from Chinatown in the south, up through the wayward lanes and ancient side streets of Greenwich Village. We simply repeat that cities are created by and for traffic. A city without traffic is a ghost town. The area between Canal Street and Third Street, a strip three quarters of a mile wide, is the most depressed area in Lower Manhattan, and one of the worst, if not the worst, slums in the entire city. Robert Moses. Condemning the West Village as a slum, and the old cast iron district to the south as an obstacle to the free flow of traffic. By 1961, he had set in motion two immense federal initiatives. A vast urban renewal project that would level 14 entire blocks along Hudson Street in the village. And an eight lane elevated highway, one of his most cherished dreams, that would drive straight across the heart of lower Manhattan from the East River to the Hudson, destroying thousands of historic structures and displacing nearly 10,000 residents and workers. It's difficult to even make anyone understand what would have happened. He would have bulldozed a swath about 225 feet wide right across Lower Manhattan. Today, that's the cast iron district of Soho. What was the vision? What was the aims of a man? who would decide, for the sake of the automobile, to cut a swath across a city, across a beautiful, vibrant, bustling part of the city. And you know, Robert Moses wanted to build three expressways across New York City, not just the Lower Manhattan. He had a Mid-Manhattan Expressway, which would have run across 30th Street in the air. And he wanted to build one again at ground level at 125th Street in Upper Manhattan Express. For decades, nothing had stopped the juggernaut of road building or slowed the rampage of urban renewal, which, in the name of rebuilding the city, had torn the heart out of one community after another. But this time, things would turn out differently. Determined to save Manhattan from the devastation that had blighted the Bronx, Residents of the village banded together and resolved to fight, selecting as their leader a 45-year-old journalist and working mother from Hudson Street, who had that very year published a groundbreaking book about the mistakes of urban planning. Her name was Jane Jacobs. The book was called The Death and Life of Great American Cities, and New York would never be the same again. And it started out by saying something like, this is an attack on city planning. And then she went through the litany of what the Corbusier and other ideologues had imagined what a city should be as opposed to what a city really was. Jane Jacobs was taking on the orthodoxies of planning that had prevailed in the post-World War II period, the ideas of Le Corbusier and the Bauhaus and, and other planners who thought that the city needed to be renewed. There were areas that, 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 that needed help, but the kind of help that she saw that they needed was uh, the assistance to allow people to continue living in their brownstones, in the neighborhoods where they had a harmony with their neighbors. And the destruction of those neighborhoods is one of the great tragedies of, of post-World War II New York. She understood that urban economies are different. She understood the sort of beehive, thousand different interdependent functions, nature of urban economies. And that's what we lose when we surrender the street to the automobile. When people don't want to be on the street anymore, 
when they reshape their lives in a way that they're always in privatized space rather than sharing public space. Jay Jacobs knew 35 years ago that that was a recipe for the destruction of what makes cities wonderful. Look what they have built. Low-income projects that become worse centers of delinquency and vandalism than the slums they were supposed to replace. Promenades that go from no place to nowhere and have no promenaders. Expressways that eviscerate great cities. This is not the rebuilding of cities. This is the sacking of cities. Jane Jacobs. She hit the nerve at the right moment with that book. It was the right book at exactly the right moment because she made people see particulars. She made them see the street. This had been a period of urban renewal when everything was on a model, on a big plan or a drawing with overlays. And she made people look at the street and what was there. She spoke about the eyes on the street, the smaller buildings where people looked out and watched their neighbors. She spoke about the small stores, the mom and pop stores, all of the things that urban renewal not only was destroying, but didn't acknowledge existed. She basically said that from her house at 555 Hudson Street in the West Village, from the sidewalk of her block, you could observe what a whole city was like. But it returned the discussion of what urbanism should be about, what New York should be about, from big land plan games to individuals, shops, streets, cars, crosswalks, networks of people, people rich and poor living more closely together, less concerned with the elevator to the 35th floor and more concerned with the life in the five-story walk-up. Under the seeming disorder of the old city, wherever the old city is working successfully, is a marvelous order for maintaining the safety of the streets and the freedom of the city. It is a complex order. Its essence is the intricacy of sidewalk use, bringing with it a constant succession of eyes. This order is composed of movement and change, and we may liken it to the dance, not to a simple-minded precision dance, but to an intricate ballet in which the individual dancers and ensembles all have distinctive parts which miraculously reinforce each other and compose an orderly whole. Jane Jacobs. Her writing enabled people to imagine her block, but also enabled people to see, to see other blocks. She created, maybe without intending to do it, a kind of empathy and opened up possibilities for empathy as a political force in the 60s. So that once people could imagine how other people lived, even if they didn't concretely know, they could help them, they could work for them, they could work together. When she comes out with her book in 1961, it's, it's not just that it's brilliantly written, it's pithy, it's punchy, it's down to earth, uh, uh, you know, it's enjoyable, it's entertaining, it's mind capturing. It's not just that, it's that what she is doing is providing a counter narrative, a counter argument, a counter vision of what the city is. But it's a vision that says you don't want to break out manufacturing and send it off somewhere else. You don't want to, in fact, send the citizens off to the suburbs. You, what you want to have is an integrated community the way it used to be, in essence. But you want to have people in a position to walk to work. You want small-scale buildings. You want people to be able to watch the streets. I mean, crime, to some extent, is beginning to explode in the city in the 50s, and a lot of it is... You know, there certainly is the pathology of drugs and such, but it is also from shattered communities that have been renewed and removed and highwayed out and uh, are in turmoil and are about, you know, in the 60s to really explode. And not just here again, but all across the country. Armed with a philosophy capable of countering those in power, 
Jacobs and her colleagues threw themselves into the fight, holding rallies, staging demonstrations, and attacking in public hearings and in print the underlying assumptions behind the culture of the automobile and of urban renewal. And also, you know, Jacobs is an activist. She doesn't just simply write about this stuff, but then she's out in the streets. She's demonstrating. They're trying to block the Lower Manhattan Expressway. They're trying to stop the plan to run roadways through Washington Square. They're counter-planning. They're planning a West Village building project, which is based on rehabilitation. As he had in the Bronx, Robert Moses fought them every step of the way, marshalling every weapon at his command to blunt the opposition. The fellow's personally affected, adversely, or he thinks he is, he's going to be opposed to you. He doesn't want it bad. He doesn't want it done at all, or he wants it done somewhere else. He wants it moved away. Now, he may be wrong. In more than half the case, or three quarters of the case, he's wrong from his own point of view. What do you I mean by that? I mean by that, that he doesn't know what's in his own interest. He isn't smart enough to visualize what you're going to do. Well, once you've built the thing, he comes around and he tells you he was always for it. Has that happened to you? Oh, all the time. All the time. For decades, Robert Moses had simply ridden roughshod over all those who disagreed with him, brutally negating the power of votes, Jane Jacobs charged, with the power of money. But this time, he had completely misjudged the strength of the opposition, rising up from the streets of Greenwich Village, which had been the center of political dissent in the city since the days of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire, and before. I think it maybe couldn't have happened anywhere else. The Lower East Side is different. The village is different. It has a history. There were very experienced organizers. We were not Johnny-come-latelys. We not only knew how to organize, we not only knew how to get publicity, we not only knew how to mobilize the troops, but we knew how to form coalitions. Mafiosi, radical Jews, factory owners, Chinese merchants, people who ordinarily never had anything to say to each other, people who ordinarily hated each other, came together to stop this. They discovered that different kinds of people could work together and really make a difference and generate a kind of power that neither of them by themselves could ever have imagined. They would call a meeting and there would be three times as many people as anybody expected they'd have to find a new hall. Uh, and there was a particular thrill in this at the end of the 50s and the start of the 60s that we might be able to really make a difference. And that there was a power that was even greater than the power of cars, the power of people. At the head of the unlikely coalition was Jane Jacobs herself. Frustrated at one public hearing, she and her colleagues tore up the stenographer's report, then declared that since there was no official record of the hearing, there had been no hearing. She was arrested and charged with riot, inciting to riot, criminal mischief, and obstructing public administration. But public support for her actions only grew. Mr. Moses says that the expressway must go through regardless of who stands in the way. Do you agree with that? Absolutely not. If this expressway goes through, it will absolutely be catastrophic. This will set a pattern, no doubt, there that will be followed there in other parts of the city. And if he has his way, he'll crisscross the city north, south, east, and west, bisect it, trisect it, every which way with expressways. Expressways to Mr. Moses are evidently more important than people. The you know, evidence people. of the need of that thing is overwhelming from the point of view of engineering and traffic. And that's all that matters? Well, in the end, yes. Congestion gets bad enough, have to have it. In the meantime, what happens? The Salvio doesn't want it, so what? The battle over the Lower Manhattan Expressway came to a crucial climax on the night of December 11th, 1962, at a tense, crowded meeting of the Board of Estimate on the second floor of City Hall. Except for one old man, Assemblyman Louis de Salvio declared, I've been unable to find anyone of technical competence who is for this so-called expressway. 
And this old man is a cantankerous, stubborn old man who has done many things which may have in their time been good for New York City. But I think that the time has come for the stubborn old man to realize that too many of his dreams turn out to be nightmares for the city. And this board must realize that if it does not kill this stupid example of bad city planning, that the stench of it will haunt them and this great city for many years to come. Jane Jacobs led the fight against that expressway. That was Moses' last, he had many last hurrahs, but that really did it. Every major politician, Lindsay Koch, then a congressman, uh, was in it. it was, the debates were all over the press, nationally and internationally. And somehow the fate of what an inner city, a historic but still very modern city would be, was being decided on whether these super projects, whether clearance for housing or for an expressway, could go forward in um, an existing city, or whether the people who live there had rights to their own environment. In the end, Jacobs and her allies prevailed. Board of Estimate in an executive session today voted unanimously to turn down a proposal for a Lower Manhattan Expressway. The board pays. I wonder how David felt when he bested Goliath. That's the way we felt. We felt we beat Robert Moses, you know? Sir, you look fairly relieved, too. You lived right in the path of the yes, proposal. Right on Broome Street. So this is a reprieve from a long time sentence, isn't it? It is, yes. It was the greatest thing the mayor ever did for the people in that neighborhood because everybody was worried that that and that everybody was getting sick over it. So when they hear this news, this will be the best news that they ever heard for Christmas. This will act as a Christmas present for the people on Broome Street. Would you say that uh, the result was in this case a triumph of public opinion against no. Bob Moses? No. Oh. There hasn't been any triumph for anybody yet. Robert Moses always felt that he was a tremendous failure in Manhattan, that he couldn't communicate his vision to people. He built highways around the edges, but he could never get through the center. People just wouldn't buy it. They stayed attached to their streets, to their grungy houses, to their crummy neighborhoods, and kept him from doing this. They abstained from the flow. They didn't want to be part of the flow. One result of this is that Manhattan is one of the very few parts of America where you can live a whole life without a car, okay? and where your daily life can depend on the street and on interacting with other people and on seeing what's going to happen in ways that you don't plan. And in that way, New York is different from, I think, probably every other American city. It may be the only American city without an expressway going through the center of town. And Moses felt extremely frustrated and mortified by this. But he just couldn't do it. The community protests were too great. It was a crucial turning point in the life of New York and in the culture of cities everywhere. With their stunning victory, Jacobs and her allies had reasserted the value of the city block, and by extension, that of urban public space itself, challenging the most basic assumptions upon which New York had proceeded since the dawn of the modern age, that the new was always better than the old. And there's a sensitivity to history, which is also a new dimension to this. I mean, you got to understand that since the 20s, it's been modern, modern, modern. And modern means dump the past, break with the past, think new, think Art Deco, think streamlined, think projectile, think, you know, tear down the old stuff, not just because, well, there may be, you know, constraint on our ability to make profits, but because it's old, because the new is intrinsically superior to the old. But... Jacob says, wait a minute, part of the texture of life in a city is that people are not just connected to each other on the street by virtue of being neighbors, but they're connected in time. There's some sense in the buildings around you that, you know, remain that give you a sense of being part of a continuum. 
You know, the history isn't dead. It's not something which has been transcended. Today is not the first day of the rest of your life. People are beings in time, and they need to be uh, surrounded, not entirely, but, you know, to some extent, by the legacy, the built environment of the past. Three years later, Jacob's triumph would be codified in an extraordinary new law. When on April 19th, 1965, Mayor Robert Wagner signed legislation establishing the Landmarks Preservation Commission. The agency came two years too late to save Penn Station. But in the years to come, it would save hundreds of individual buildings in New York from the records ball, along with entire districts, including Brooklyn Heights, Greenwich Village, and Soho itself. Vibrant places Robert Moses had yearned so passionately to transform. Well, the dark side of Moses' character was probably every bit as prominent as the bright side, especially in the context of New York City. On the one hand, we can admit that the city needed a Robert Moses to adapt and become a modern city. On the other hand, Robert Moses saw the city in some sense as a transportation problem. But New York is more than a transportation problem. And having created, let's say, the kind of minimal number of new roads and new bridges that the city needed to sort of function in the second half of the 20th century, then he began to maybe continue that beyond what was absolutely essential. And persons like Jane Jacobs and others began to say, now wait a minute, why do we need this road? That the whole purpose of things is not to see how fast you can move traffic. That there's a city there, that there are people who live in neighborhoods, there are people who like it the way it is. And I think that Moses never really understood that. A man who never drove, but who created an automobile kind of circumstance, a man who was responsible for planning and building this enormous metropolis, and I think you can't escape the feeling that he really wasn't comfortable in the very city that he was responsible for building. Are you surprised that after all this time and the evidence that we've seen in cities like Detroit and uh, all the sort of urban disasters that we've experienced that that in some ways you're still regarded as a radical. No, it doesn't surprise me. Um, people don't change their minds that fast. Somebody said, um, it's a rather grim thing, that uh, progress occurs funeral by funeral. <laughs> And I think there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, I put a great deal of faith in young people. Uh, of course, they turn old and they may get frozen in their ideas, but uh, they don't have quite as much trouble accepting new ideas. Okay, I'm on the left and I want to embrace Jane Jacobs. I'm in the center, and I want to embrace Jane Jacobs. I'm on the right, and I want to embrace Jane Jacobs. I have reasons from all ideological positions to both love you and loathe you. Yeah, that's because I'm not ideological. What I think ideologies about? are blinders. Always have been. The kind of mind I have is basically uh, a scientific one, and I respect uh, observation and experiment and what happens, and not uh, abstractions or theories about what ought to be or what ought to happen. I like to know how things really work. You hold creativity and innovation in real high esteem. Yes, because we have to do things better than we're doing them. And where are we going to get better ways if we aren't creative and if we aren't innovative? We use what's called human capital. Our skills, experience, and human capital is wonderful. It's the, it doesn't run out. The more you use it, the more you have of it. I want to close on uh, Jane Jacobs because uh, 
here you are, you're writing books. You told me before you're going on a book tour all over the West Coast. I noticed when there was a, an issue about a high rise in Yorkville in Toronto, you were at the public uh, meeting. What keeps you so passionately committed to the things that you really believe in? Well, I'm really much more passionately committed to writing about them. That's what I, um, that's my real work. And that's what I'm most eager to do. I don't like getting in these fights. I, they make my life absurd. Uh, not because it's absurd to, to oppose these things. If you're a responsible person, you have to oppose uh, things that are dumped right on your neighborhood, right in an area that you know about. Uh, but uh, I don't choose these issues, they're, they're absurd issues usually, and I feel they make my life absurd. I, there seems to be some idea that I enjoy being a troublemaker. No, I enjoy uh, sitting and writing and learning uh, and uh, trying to educate people. Um, I don't enjoy uh, having to push all that aside for nonsense. Jane Jacobs, I want to thank you very much for joining me. As always, it's a real pleasure. Well, thank you. You have very good questions. <laughs>